Ouais. Hello, um, can you send a couple of staff into the frags, please? There's no one in here. Thanks. One. These are Inspiring South Australia. Science, Boat and Nature General Trust. And Nature General Trust and Red Boat. their presentations okay. on. So we've got a couple so far. So that's the that's already scrolling. So okay. on the on the desktop we've got that video is up. That's got to be played while the minister's talking, which um, I might get one of you to press go on. Mm -hmm. If you just sit next to me and I'll queue you up mm -hmm. when, uh, when I know he's about mm -hmm. to start speaking, you come up and just press go on it. Mm -hmm. um, and just go on that. Go is down here. Oh yeah. On gotcha. the left. <laughs> Makes sense. And then And then, yeah, just getting people set up with the mic. So, the minister, I don't know if you're... Oh, has Sandy got that? She must mm -hmm. have already come up on. Yeah. But there's um, another mic over there. And just make sure that everyone's queued up. Yeah, at 9 a.m. Fred should be in a different section. Oh, yeah, like okay. Would prefer me to be here? I think you should stay here. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. Someone else, because yes. those other people probably should have already been here. It's just because the registration it's line is crazy. Huge. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Do you want to put this yeah. over there? There's one. Thanks for coming in, guys. I just, yeah. No worries. It's kind of mayhem out there. All right. So this is this is the mic, right? Hello. Um, I guess I could go and put up a ten dollar and then come back. Go where? Back to the registration. Oh yeah. I need to go to the toilet. I don't know where the toilet is in this place. Yeah. So, do you know when we're supposed to kick off? Nine? Okay, it's in 20 minutes. Yeah. I just pop to the toilet really quickly and yeah. then I come back and yeah. then I'll pass you here. Yeah. 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 I'm supposed to be here. Oh, okay. Technically. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the <laughs> bag person will probably come here then. Yeah. I think it's Natasha. Yeah. I just didn't. I didn't meet any. I didn't <laughs> meet anybody. <laughs> no. Oh, I'll be right back.
Take that. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, the short story. Which one are you? Okay, I'm just gonna write up for you on this. Yeah, I'm not sure which order I'm doing it in. But so you've copied it over? I have copied it into the desktop. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Alright, we're back. We're back. There's gotta be a way of doing this. I wonder if it no, it would be here. <laughs> That'll just only take one of them off. And it basically goes to that one. 
Okay, fine, maybe. Cool. Yeah, I just had to figure out how to so mute you? it. Ah, okay. Because Chris wanted to run through each side. So that's that one. It's got to be that one. Cool. Are you um cool to mic everyone up? Like, I think so, and yeah. Are you in here today? Yeah, all day yeah. or till one or something. So you're cool to mic everyone. So first up, I mean, the list is there. Sandy Crothers is going to be introducing everyone. Mm -hmm. Then we're going to have um, Welcome to Country by. Um, uh, Carl Smith, his name's um, Tamaru, mm -hmm. his traditional name, which mm -hmm. from there, but. And then um, Minister Spears. Oh, I know um, Carl. I don't know him personally. I know, yeah. Yeah, cool. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so hopefully so he'll, up, he's and then probably running around up, hopefully. So. And then, uh, and then it'll be um, first up after the minister. So the, the minister won't take very long. And it'll which probably one only was be that eight again? Minutes. So we might just... So, so the one for the minister...
can use this one. Morning everyone, thanks Tamari, that was great. Um, so welcome to the 2018 NRM Science Conference. My name's Sandy Carruthers, I'm the GED for Science and Information with the Department for Environment and Water, and I'll be your MC for this morning. So thanks for coming, it's great to see so many people here. We've got 700 registrations for the conference, um, so we hope that you'll have a really fantastic two days. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging that we meet on the land of the Ghana people, and I pay my respect to Elders past, present and future. In just a few moments, I'll invite Tamaru to start the formal proceedings and welcome us to country. So Ninamani Tamaru. So just before I do that, um, just a couple of things um, to let you know. Conference is organised by the Department of Environment and, and, and Water on behalf of the NRM Research and Innovation Network, which is a partnership between the state government, the three state universities and the environmental NGOs. The so conference also has a number of external sponsors, um, including the Goida Institute for Water, the National Environmental Science Program Threatened Species Hub, Inspiring South Australia, Biotech, Animate Your Science, Nature Glenelg Trust and Red Boat, and we thank all of those sponsors. And I'd also like to acknowledge and thank the University of Adelaide for so generously providing the university grounds and the lecture theatres for us once again. Um, so in the unlikely event that there's any kind of an emergency, we'll just follow the instructions that were given. That's probably the best advice I can give you. All the lecture theatres have exits at the um, front and at the back, and the, um, and the uh, evacuation meeting point is just, just behind us on the Barsmith lawns. Um, morning and afternoon tea and lunch will all be on the lawns just here, so um, please mingle there. Um, and there are toilets in all of the university buildings, including, and they're all signposted. And there's also the Inkani Wadi building just over here. Um, and most importantly, and I've just broken this rule myself, is timekeeping. So I'm going to say we're going to start on time, but we were running a little bit late this morning. And we do have a really packed agenda, um, and we'd like to start the sessions on time and keep to time. Um, we're filming all of the keynotes, and we're, we're recording all of the other um, uh, talks, and they're programmed to start on time, so we'd like to keep to that. So basically, just at the end of morning tea, lunch and afternoon tea, if you could try to be seated one minute just before they start, and then after that, feel free to move between lecture theatres and, and go to the talks that you like. So that's, that's all of the, um, the sort of the tidy stuff from me. So now I'd like to invite Tamaru to welcome us to country. So please make Tamaru feel welcome. Nina Mani, everybody. So Nina Mani in my native tongue of the Ghana people means good morning, so I hope you're all well. We're all well? Yes. yes. All right, so I'd 
I'd like to address you in my language. So in my language this morning, I'd like to say, Nyanka na meena, nyaka na talia, nyaka na talia, mani na bodhani kandam nyango bambam balia. So what I've just said is good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and dearest brothers and dearest sisters. It's good that you came to Adelaide to do a conference. Now I'd also like to say, gana meena na nadu gana yada takaditi. We acknowledge and we recognise we are meeting on Ghana land. Gana meena na nadu gana yada takaditi. We acknowledge that you are sitting on Ghana country and you're doing business. Um, I'd also like to say Natalia and Nakata. So that means respect and goodbye, but not forever. But I'd like to also address you in your native tongue, in English. So uh, just got a few quick little words. Uh, as a representative of the Ghana nation, of people of this land, I would like to welcome you to our Ghana country. I do this greeting to you in the spirit of humanity from our applicable ancestors, the traditional custodians upon whose ancestral lands we are meeting on today. We acknowledge the deep feelings and attachment and relationship of Ghana people to our yurta, to our land. I would also pay my respects and recognise all non-Aboriginal people here today um, who have joined us. Ladies and gentlemen, and it is with great pleasure that I formally welcome you to our shared Yurta Ghana country. Um, out of respect to my elders past and my elders present, I, I welcome you to Ghana country. Um, the Ghana community, as some people may or may not know here, we're a very giving and sharing culture. So today I have a gift for somebody in the audience. So I'm going to pick you. Come up here, please. That'd be you, yes. Another person behind you. Now, as you may or may not know, and hopefully you do know, uh, the Ghana community are the first ever Aboriginal community in Australia that has native title over a capital city. <laughs> now, you know, in due course, when we finally get through the paperwork about what we can and can't do on our lands again, uh, you know, I really appreciate all the good work you guys do in the environmental side and looking after our country. So in saying that, I have a gift from my grandfather, this is very special, and I mean this from the bottom of my heart, which is Nitalia, which is respect. On behalf of the Ghana people, I give you a gift. <laughs> uh, as you can see, the Ghana people, we're a sustainable culture, and we also have lots of uses for many tools. So this is one people think is a boomerang, it's also a message stick. So what we do is we have a very firm handle here, we hold it up and we teach people that when I've got this in the air, Tamaru and Tamaru only does the talking. Now if you're not getting the message, we'll try. <laughs> <laughs> right. So no tell you. Thank you. I'll use it for my presentation. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, Tamaru. That was fantastic. And um, everyone's jealous of that stick now. I can. <laughs> All right, so. So, as you'd all know, several weeks ago we had a state election um, and we now have a Liberal government as a result and a new Minister for Environment and Water. So, this is Minister Spears' first conference opening, and I'm delighted to invite him to open the conference and say a few words. So, please, please welcome Minister Spears. Good morning everyone and uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to, to join you this morning. I'd firstly like to uh, th start by thanking Carl Smith for his welcome to country and I would also like to acknowledge that the land we're meeting on today is the traditional land of the uh, Garner people and I respect their spiritual relationship with the land and respect their elders past, present and future. Uh, today I, I come to this event in what is really my first official function um, in terms of a speaking engagement uh, as, the, as South Australia's uh, new Minister for Environment and Water. I had 
slight shadow on the tip of my tongue there because I am still getting used to calling myself the minister. It's a, a phenomenal privilege to be able to be uh, our beautiful state's uh, steward of our environment from, a, uh, from an administrative and, uh, and ministerial level. It is uh, something that I find uh, an absolute prim privilege, a huge honour, and I uh, look forward to working with many people in South Australia, particularly uh, in the, the academic and science-based community, uh, to leave a, a legacy for our future generations and, and for those who uh, are enjoying South Australia today uh, in terms of the livability of our environment and the sustainability of our natural environment. We should not and cannot underestimate the um, the phenomenal impact that a living in a, in a natural landscape like South Australia has to offer uh, can, can have on, on this society. And whether my time in this role is long or short, uh, I do hope that we can work together to, to leave a legacy uh, for future generations. I um, think it is, it is a, a great opportunity to be able to open a, a conference like this, bringing together around 800 delegates uh, who have a, a passion and interest and a significant knowledge and understanding of uh, our natural environment and uh, the experience uh, to be able to work with government, with not-for-profit organizations, with uh, our business community to be able to uh, deliver our outcomes for uh, for our natural environment it is um I had the opportunity last night to, to look through the program for, for this uh, next couple of days of events and I was uh, actually quite uh, disheartened that I wouldn't be able to spend more than just a, a short time this morning with you because uh, my new life doesn't quite give me the flexibility to be able to sit in a conference for, for a few hours but looking through the program and seeing uh, the sorts of uh, keynote speakers, panelists and uh, and workshop uh, facilitators and contributors. Uh, I, was, I was jealous at the, the um, calibre uh, of, uh, of speakers that you will get to get to enjoy uh, at the conference over the next couple of days. And, and um, all credit to, to the department that I have the opportunity of working with uh, for organizing uh, with, you, with your partner, Sandy, uh, this, um, this great, great event. Because I, I, looking at that, that timetable, that schedule for the next couple of days, I, I was really encouraged by the number of people who've, uh, who've been brought together to provide content for the conference. I had breakfast this morning with uh, uh, with the chief executive of my department or the acting chief executive John Schutz and uh, he told me that uh, there is a, a lot of energy and excitement around this conference particularly uh, from the, the success of the conference two years ago uh, being able to build on that to have a particularly uh, high quality uh, program of events this time around. The, the government is only two weeks old in South Australia and uh, we have put on the table a very strong reform agenda for environmental policy in our state. Uh, it would be my view that the last time that there was such a significant reform agenda on the table uh, was when there was last a change of government in South Australia when Labor took office in 2002 and they brought to the table a substantial amount of reform uh, in environmental policy and the government that I'm part of uh, is certainly very keen uh, to drive forward it's very significant reform. Uh, I, as Shadow Minister for the last 14 months, I've had the opportunity to develop a whole range of uh, policies which uh, were tested in the public uh, public sphere uh, over over the year leading up to the election, uh, some for a longer period of time, some closer to the, ele the election itself. And, um, and I am excited to now work with the department and to work with the wider community to implement over the next four years a, a quite ambitious uh, set of uh, environmental policies. We are looking uh, particularly at a suite of policies which want to harness the knowledge and understanding uh, from ex external sources, not just in government, work in partnership with South Australian communities, uh, rely on the knowledge and understanding of the science community, of 
the, the, the uh, academic community, of people who are working uh, in the environmental uh, arena on a day on uh, and day off basis, and also uh, relying significantly on the knowledge and understanding within communities. Uh, I know from my experience of traveling around South Australia that some of the people who've got the, the greatest understanding of, of the way the environment works are those who manage the land and, and uh, sustain the land on a day-to-day -day basis. And so uh, as I take um, take on this, this role and, and this ministry, uh, I will be looking to forge partnerships uh, on a continual basis uh, with the community. That in some ways poses a challenge because uh, I have um, responsibility for an agency which has a significant amount of uh, science and expertise built into it and many people with expertise, significant expertise in specialized fields are in the room this morning. Now, Prior to my election I, um, in 2014, I had a role in the public service around community engagement. And one of the things that I identified when driving forward a community agenda, a community engagement agenda for, for government was the, the barrier that expertism, that experience, that knowledge and understanding can actually uh, put in the way of uh, bringing a community along, along on a journey to a particular place, particularly in those areas where uh, expertise is significant and the environmental policy space is one of those areas. But rather than that being seen as a barrier, I would really challenge the audience uh, who have, are attending this conference over the next uh, couple of days to see that as an opportunity. How can we uh, look at breaking down barriers between expertise in one hand and uh, to reach a point of bringing a community along on an empowered journey on the other hand? Um, I looked through the uh, conference uh, uh, speakers and the, the uh, brief synopsis of some of the, uh, the conversations that you're going to be having over the next couple of days, and, and I see that that is something that is addressed on an ongoing basis, uh, and so I hope that those conversations are had, and, and that can be fed back into the Department of Environment and Water here in South Australia, uh, so that we can work um, better at community engagement and can be um, form those partnerships with the, uh, the scientific community and be able to communicate effectively and engage effectively with the broader community to explain why we are taking um, particular decisions and to be open to um, uh, changing our approaches uh, in order to bring that, that community along with us. While staying true to, to science and, um, and respecting uh, that knowledge and understanding that has been built up over many years and decades in, in some circumstances. The, um, the, th that challenge uh, is, is something that I, I find um, confronts me on a day-to-day -day basis as I have to balance the, um, uh, the exercising of my duties as a, as, a, as a minister who has to rely on the advice and experience and, and uh, scientific knowledge of my department while also dealing with the realities of community expectations, political needs, which are a, an unfortunate reality of this job at times, and being able to deliver outcomes for South Australian communities uh, from an environmental perspective in a timely and efficient and, and productive way. So I, 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 I guess I leave that as a, as a challenge this morning and uh, would love to, to hear your feedback in due course and feel free to get in touch with me if you have ideas and uh, views as to how the agency, uh, the agency that I now have responsibility for can do that better. This morning we have the opportunity to, uh, well I have the opportunity to launch a, a particularly exciting project and that is the, um, 
the SA land cover project, which is a new mapping capability measuring change uh, in the landscape over time. And it's a really great example of a, a government department uh, building uh, partnerships and re uh, relationships to, to deliver a project. And I do need to make sure that I refer to my notes to talk about, uh, to make sure I mention exactly who, who was involved in this project, because the, the new SA land cover data, data set is a result of a collaboration between the South Australian government, Geoscience Australia, the Australian Department of the Environment and Energy, uh, the Victorian state government, and the SA Natural Resource Management Boards. And, and this data set, uh, using, a remote sen using remote sensing data from Geosciences Science Australia's data cube, allows us to, for the first time, uh, to sp spatially map changes in land cover, including native vegetation, orchards, vineyards, forestry, urban areas, and wetlands over time from 1987 to 2015, so over a space of close to 30 years. And you, this morning you can see images from that uh, this data set uh, being presented uh, on the screen behind me. It is a really great example of, of government taking a, a, a leadership role uh, around science, uh, searching for and building partnerships with uh, related organizations and entities, using data which the government uh, has responsibility and stewardship of anyway, and putting that out into the public domain for uh, other people to be able to use to inform their, um, their decision making. Particular groups that would be interested in this would be academia, uh, local government, uh, non-government organizations, and even businesses who are in the, um, in the agriculture or environmental space. Uh, so from today, uh, the SA land cover data set will be uh, available online for, um, for anyone to be able to access. A great example of open data, an area that uh, the previous government began to pioneer, uh, which uh, the government that I am part of is very keen to continually look for opportunities to publicly disclose data held by the government. We don't want to be holding tightly on to this information. Instead, we want to be handing it over to communities where appropriate, making it um, available to inform research, to inform business decisions, to inform better uh, outcomes in, the, in agriculture and environment and in, um, and in good decision making uh, across the board. So uh, I guess with those words, uh, I, I declare the, the data set launched, the first launch that I've done as a minister. And, um, and just in closing, I would like to thank everyone for uh, attending uh, this conference this morning. I would like to thank those who have been involved in putting together presentations, which will be uh, presented over the next couple of days. Uh, I would like to thank the delegates uh, in advance for your contribution to conversations, uh, to ideas being developed over the next couple of days, and I certainly look forward to talking to my department about the outcomes of this event and how my department can work really closely and the government that I am part of can partner with the, the people who are involved in this conference to deliver better outcomes for the South Australian environment. So thank you for your time and enjoy the conference. So thanks very much to the Minister, it was great. That was a really um, great uh, start to the conference. All right, so on to our keynote speakers. Um, so our first keynote is Professor Chris Helgen. Chris is Professor of Biological Sciences and the Deputy Director of the Centre of Applied Conservation Science here at the University of Adelaide. Um, I've heard Chris talk a few times and he's really fantastic at linking scientific, scientific discovery with real world consequences. So please make Chris feel welcome. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks to the organizers and uh, all of you for, for joining us today. It's a, a real honor to talk this morning, to open things up. Uh, 
I want to, at the outset, uh, thank Tim Lehman and the National Geographic Society for the chance to use a lot of the images that I'm going to uh, be showing us today. Let's talk about mammals for a little while. The island of New Guinea, the world's largest tropical island, sits just to the north of the Australian country. And uh, I had just turned 21 years old when I first uh, went up to New Guinea. I'd finished my undergraduate studies. I'd taken up studying with, with Professor Tim Flannery here down in Adelaide. Now, Tim took a fairly casual approach to sending me up to New Guinea for the first time. Uh, I went up on my own, 21. Uh, I had very little in the way of contacts, and I went, if you were to throw a dart at the map of the island of New Guinea, right in the dead center of it, right near the border between West Papua and PNG, uh, are the Star Mountains, and that's, that's where I went. I was off looking for lost species of giant rats. And it's been almost two decades later, it didn't take me that long to realize there's a lot more to planning work in New Guinea uh, than that sort of approach, but that was before we did risk assessments and all the rest. But an extraordinary jewel of a place. What drew me to a place like New Guinea was the extraordinary mammal fauna. I had grown up as a, a teenager reading things like National Geographic magazine and reading Tim Flannery's books about these fantastic adventures discovering new species of, of mammals. Mammals, even in, in the 21st century or late 20th century in New Guinea, it's like tree kangaroos, this kind of animal. Or the world's largest monotremes, egg-laying mammals, like this long-beaked echidna up here in the western part of New Guinea. And I did that for about 10 years as a PhD student and afterwards, very concerted efforts to start to explore, building on those first initial early efforts and um, continuing expanding the work into some of the least explored corners of the island of New Guinea. And so at first that involved small expeditions, hiking in, and as we uh, got better and, and more uh, savvy about things, we were um, landing teams in helicopters into places like this, the Foja Mountains of Western Papua, one of the least explored tropical corners of our planet. This is a mountain range about 100 kilometers across that rises about uh, 7,000 feet up into the sky, uh, where as far as we knew, no one, no scientists had ever gone to see what mammals lived in places like this. This was, this was, uh, these were heady days. This was some of the most amazing kind of thrill discovery of my life, working in uh, these tented camps, setting up, um, setting up spaces to work in areas where as far as we knew, um, not just no scientists, but in some cases no people perhaps had ever set foot. Extraordinary places to get in and for the first time perhaps document the tropical richness, the rich biodiversity of environments like an isolated tropical montane rainforest in New Guinea. So tented camps, um, isolated field areas where we were setting up traps and other ways to try to cleverly figure out what was living in forests like this. And many of you have done work like this, basic biodiversity work, where you take a, a simple thing like a live trap, you put it down on the forest floor, you come back a little later and you see what you've caught. In this case, places like New Guinea, nocturnal animals, and you'd go in the early evening, set up a trap line, lay it out, and in the morning go back, just like you see here, take a peek inside. But think about the thrill of a place like the Foja Mountains, the chance to maybe look into a trap like that and in a case like this, maybe see a kind of animal that not just no scientist, but maybe even no person has ever taken a look at before in a place this isolated and uninhabited. So that's the thrill I'm talking about, the chance to get into some corners of the world like this and, and see what's there. And we use camera traps too. Uh, some of you have probably seen these pictures before. I'm showing some of my favorite mammals. This too is from the Foja Mountains. So not just traps, live traps on the ground, um, but camera traps set up in the forest. This is about a decade ago, working up in one of these isolated mountain ranges. And imagine coming back, checking your camera, and seeing that this animal, this tree kangaroo, has taken a look in it overnight. So this species is called Dendrolagus pulcherimus. Dendrolagus are the tree kangaroos. Pulcherimus, if you remember some of your Latin, actually means most beautiful. This is the most beautiful tree kangaroo, an apt name, and it was named and discovered scientifically by Tim Flannery only in the 1990s. And 
At the time that we took these pictures, we only actually knew that this species lived in another mountain range several hundreds of kilometers away in the next country over, PNG. Here we are in West Papua, and we documented living in this area and overlooked population of this critically endangered species. But what a beautiful animal. We learn little bits and pieces about the lives of these animals with these little bits of detective work. Here it is, taking a look into the camera. It raises its head, looks up. Look at the markings on this animal. Backs up a little, you see that beautiful tail. And ultimately it chooses a different way to cross over on this log bridge where we found it. But it's a chance when working in places like New Guinea to work with some of the most remarkable people on our planet as well. People that know their environments um, like we probably never would or will. People that are in so many ways just like us but live lives that we would find very hard to recognize. Extraordinary people. And it's education like this, hunting with um, men especially in forests in, in Papua New Guinea and West Papua that taught me so much more about uh, the wildlife of these areas than I ever would have been able to learn uh, from books or from museum specimens or from the other traditional ways that we learn about these things. Extraordinary educations in places like these. And Along the way, uh, we've turned up things that had been not seen previously by scientists, things that didn't have scientific names, and I'm just going to show you a very few of my favorites. This is an animal called um, the blue-eyed spotted cuscus, a species that's found only in western New Guinea on a little oceanic island fragment off the coast of, of New Guinea, nowhere else. It has these gorgeous blue eyes and a beautiful spotted pattern on the coat. We named this species a few years ago. Species that doesn't even have a scientific name yet. Working with a crew from the BBC, we went to a uh, study in an extinct volcano in south central Papua New Guinea, one of the most extraordinary landforms uh, on the south side of the big mountains in, in PNG, a place called Mount Basavi, uh, rising up out of lowland forests, up on the top of these cloud forests, an absolutely isolated world where we wanted to be the first to go in and see what mammals were there. This is one of the world's largest true rats, very closely related to the kinds of rats that live in cities and sewers, but uh, evolving for millions of years on its own in this isolated environment in New Guinea, uh, about a meter long. This species only found in this isolated extinct volcanic crater. Another one of my favorites, this takes us out into the Pacific Theater, the oceans, um, great oceans spanning off of the New Guinea coast. Uh, out into the Solomon Archipelago lives one of the largest bats in the world. This is called the greater monkey-faced bat. It has a larger set of jaws and teeth than any other bat on our planet. It can break open things like thick-skinned fruits and coconuts. Uh, and we didn't realize that it, that it even existed, that it needed a scientific name until about 2005. This is perhaps the most critically endangered species of mammal uh, in the Solomon Islands, and it's only now that we have a scientific name for it, that we've added it to um, added to things like the IUCN Red List to country protected lists, and we've initiated surveys and grant funded uh, projects to learn uh, more about it. But, Take a pause for a minute. How is it that arguably one, you know, the largest bat in the world um, has to wait until the 21st century to get its scientific name for us to even learn the very first thing about it? This is a clue, and we really need to acknowledge and realize this, as you'll see, um, how little we really do know about the natural world. We might imagine that we can pick up all the books off of the shelf or um, type things into to Google and Wikipedia and find what we need to know about organisms like this, but the truth is uh, we cannot do that. Uh, there's an extraordinary amount of biodiversity that remains unknown. The, actually, the grand majority of life on Earth remains unknown. Some of us know this is an ac in an academic sense, but it's very easy to forget, especially for animals like vertebrates. This is E.O. Wilson and his book, recent book, Half Earth, um, talking, speaking to the best science out there on estimating how much of the planet we know so far. And we're talking, yes, about microbial diversity, arthropod diversity like insects and deep sea organisms, but we're also so, uh, as I'm showing you today, talking about some of the best known groups out there, things like mammals and birds, uh, butterflies, where uh, we know uh, remarkably little. So if we know so little bit about the planet, uh, 
the rest of the, everything that we build on top of this, our knowledge of basic biology, our understanding of how to prioritize conservation, our cleverness in managing resources, all of that is called into question. And so um, there's a long way to go, uh, and it really matters. It matters especially uh, in a planet where um, things are increasingly endangered. This is a species we named last year. This is an ape. This is an animal we ended up calling the Skywalker Hulot Gibbon. That's a story for another time. Uh, but uh, this is uh, one of 13 species of small apes in the world, about one of about 18 species of, of apes worldwide. Um, these are our closest relatives. You know, these are the branch on the tree of life of which we are a part. And so this is a species found only in southern China and along the border with Myanmar. There's a couple hundred of those, these individuals left. It had been overlooked. No one had looked close enough to see exactly what kind of gibbon it was. Uh, and like I said, it, an ape that received its scientific name last year. Um, Quickly, one of my favorite examples that, that some of you know about, an animal called, uh, ultimately called the Olinguito. It started where many of these stories start, which is in a natural history museum where I saw some skins like that. Um, thought, for various reasons, looking at skins and bones, that this could be a fuzzy, beautiful, carnivorous animal that didn't seem to have a scientific name, took me on an adventure to the cloud forests of the Andes in, uh, in Colombia and Ecuador, and ultimately um, let me track down this species in the wild, the animal we call the Olinguito. We named this as new to science a few years ago. It's a species of raccoon related to other raccoons, but completely overlooked by scientists and to the extent we were able to understand even by local people. It looks a little bit like a few other different animals that live in the forest. It's very rare. It only comes out at nights and it only stays up in the trees. Well, giving this thing a name, putting it into field guides, putting it into uh, protected species plans, all of a sudden we launched um, global knowledge that this thing was even existing and real and it's got a lot of people interested. This week, um, the Olinguito, just a few years later, is on the cover of Journal Mammalogy. We've published another paper. We're using citizen science data. This has been extraordinary. High school teachers, bird watchers, national park staff who live in the, the range of the Olinguito in Colombia and Ecuador have gotten so interested in this animal that they've uh, launched uh, uh, interest and in, in initiatives to go and see what they can find out about it. So when we first documented it as new to science, we didn't know very much about it. Now uh, information continues to pour in uh, from uh, platforms like iNaturalist, um, citizen science initiatives, but also just organic efforts to every few days I'll get a picture from someone saying, is this, is this an Olinguito? Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. Uh, but these things, these discoveries, um, can interest people, but we can't do this work if we don't know that these things are even there. And maybe it surprises you, maybe not, to know that these kinds of um, undiscovered creatures include animals like this. Um, physics illusions made in biology can go a little too far, but some call these sorts of things, this 80% that Ed Wilson is talking about of unknown biodiversity across the scope of the planet, the, the taxonomic dark matter that's out there. And in a way that's kind of apt. We know, we, have, we can estimate it, we can see it, we can genetically detect a lot of it, but we still don't know what it is. We don't have names for it. We don't know what these things do for a living. We don't, uh, we don't know really anything about it. And uh, again, that quote, that takes on a remarkable urgency when we think about extinction. And extinction is spread across the whole tree of life and it's happening in an accelerating manner on a human-dominated planet. Just three examples of animals that, that I know and love. On uh, the left, you see the Sumatran rhinoceros. This is one of the world's largest mammals. This is a, uh, the uh, two-horned rhinoceros of Asia. Uh, there's about, arguably, about 30 left in the entire world. So 100 years ago, these lived in about 12 or 13 countries. Today, they're found only on the island of Sumatra and Borneo, and there's about 30. Um, you see the Javan rhinoceros with one horn there too. Uh, something like uh, 50 of those in the world only on the island of Java. Um, kind of perversely, the names we call them, the common names Java and Sumatra, are just sort of almost arbitrary labels that were applied a long time ago, and they've become these perverse fates for these animals. Both of these species used to live from India uh, down through to Borneo, and today are only found basically on the islands uh, that were chosen to, the, to be their names. One is only on Java, one is only on Sumatra. 
Below you see the vaquita, the world's smallest cetacean. This is a species of porpoise in the Gulf of California, Baja California, um, probably fewer than a dozen left today. Incredible impacts, very hard to live as a porpoise in the places where these do. That animal, by the way, wasn't, uh, wasn't discovered and named by scientists till the late 20th century. So even in this part of the tree of life, in the most endangered species, the most charismatic, um, this is part of the dark matter too. So it matters. Of course, we're no strangers to extinction in this country either. And you know, look at that animal and, and be moved, right? I mean, do you feel that? It's extraordinary, what an extraordinary creature. And so it's here, it's here, and we've, we've seen a lot of it in some ways. Um, what we see with things like the porpoise in Mexico or the rhinos in Indonesia, these are just countries that are less far along on their extinction trajectory than, than we already are. Um, as a quick aside, this is an Australian uh, American thylacine, a little bit like, like me. These were sent off to the National Zoo in Washington. And if you look in the back of the, the mother there, you see that there's a little baby with its, with its bum sticking out of the pouch. That's one of the only images we have of what thylacines looked like in their mom's pouch. Uh, one of the most recent mammal extinctions is the Christmas Island Pipistrelle. This is an area, again, where the dark matter aspect was important. Um, I got called in on this case about eight years ago by um, the Federal Ministry for the Environment, and they asked me, to, uh, they said there's only about a dozen, maybe two dozen, of these pipistrels we believe left on Christmas Island. Um, this is the only insectivorous bat, by the way, on this territory. So it's the only bat for presumably millions of years that's been hawking and eating insects and echolocating over this isolated fragment out in the Indian Ocean for a uh, very long time. But the question was, is it a species unique to the island or not? It had been named about 100 years ago, but no one had really uh, tested that hypothesis. And so um, this was taxonomy under pressure. I uh, very rapidly, in a matter of weeks, went to all the museums in the world that had specimens of the Christmas Island Pipistrelle and the most critical uh, specimens from other islands in Indonesia that which, against which we needed to compare it. We also very quickly had to get our hands from a variety of countries um, to, uh, on samples, of DNA samples, to compare against the Pipistrelle. Why had it declined? It's a very Australian story, frankly, about invasive species, rats and crazy ants and wolf snakes and big scolopender centipedes. All of these things have arrived in Christmas Island in the last 50 to 100 years, and they have absolutely destroyed the native fauna, bats included. We worked fast. And this is hard work. Really, really fine scale comparisons of skull anatomy, dental anatomy of these really hard to tell apart bats, as well as genetic work done with the team here at the University of Adelaide. Ultimately, we came back and reported that yes, this thing by all rights does deserve to stand as a species unto itself. Its name is Pipistrellus murii, and it's been there on Christmas Island, not interacting evolutionarily with any other bat for probably something like a million years. As we delivered that result that same week, truly, we heard the report back that no more bats were detected echolocating on the island. It hasn't been detected since. This is an extinct species. We didn't know what its name was, and we figured it out not in time. Um, it shows us the, the value of doing this work ahead of time, of knowing what's what, who is where, what these animals do for a living. A quick example from North America, I've been working in my lab on something called white nose syndrome as well. And this is a fungal disease that has wiped out bats in much of, of the United States and Canada, up to 95% mortality in some cave living species. Long story short, this fungus was something native to Europe that jumped over to North America in about 2006 um, and took America by storm, taking over caves where these animals roost and hibernate in the winter time. Uh, this species of fungus wasn't named until it started running amok in this way. So it was initially named Geomyces destructans uh, because of the destructive influence it was having on these bats. Um, first time it was named, it was moved around to another genus eventually, but this was a, similar to the Christmas Island thing, this was taxonomy under pressure. Scientists trying very, very hard to figure out who is this fungus? What do we call it? 
Where is it native to? Where does it come from? Why has it come here now? Uh, what does it do for a living? All these basic questions. And that all had to unfold while these bats were dying, and it's been a game of catch up ever since. Incidentally, this is something um, that is um, uh, understood to potentially be a problem in Australia and something that we're keeping an eye on, uh, something that could come here. One of the last examples I want to give comes from early in my work. It's not this kind of work on dark matter and taxonomy and resolving what these kinds of, of, of organisms are isn't always about naming new species or showing that something has been there a long time. One of my first studies uh, published while I was a student here in Adelaide was on the raccoons of the Caribbean. Um, there are raccoons that uh, were discovered by early European explorers on the islands of the Bahamas. Barbados and Guadeloupe out through the Caribbean archipelago and of course raccoons were discovered on the American continents too, three different species. But early explorers and taxonomists named these Caribbean raccoons as separate insular populations and that status remained on the books until about 15 years ago. It never made much sense to me. How did these raccoons get onto these islands and why were they on such scattered islands? As an undergraduate, I did a study looking at the genetics, the anatomy, and going into archival records to understand um, what I could figure out about the movements of, of people perhaps bringing raccoons in to these islands. And ultimately, we showed uh, that genetically, anatomically, and historically, all three of these Caribbean island populations had been brought within the last three or four hundred years to these islands. They were not native endemic species. They were actually introduced invasive species. They had no rights to be there. And in fact, they were dangerous to animals like ground nesting birds, uh, endemic reptiles. They spread disease. They ate sea turtle nests. And so went down to the governments of these islands and talked to people. And, in the Bahamas, and you see on the left, um, the Department of the Environment was only too happy to get this information. They loved it and they literally made the raccoon the poster child of their invasive species campaign. They say, we hate this animal, we want to get rid of it, this is good information. On Guadeloupe, uh, where the raccoon was the only sort of cuddly, supposedly native mammal, is a French territory, they said, we understand what you're saying. We, we've, we've read the papers, we understand and agree with the science, but we're going to continue uh, to love and cherish our, uh, our raccoon. And so you can still buy it in the uh, gift shops there in the, in the airport, and it's still the emblem of their national park system. So uh, you can give information to government, but you can't always you know, predict how it's going to be used. It's also kind of easy to laugh at Guadeloupe and say, well, there's a cuddly species, uh, perhaps, you know, in the Australian perspective, we're jaded with all these invasive species, you know, how can they, how can they love this, this recent invader and think that it's a, a separate species even against the science, but uh, there's also examples here. This is uh, the same kind of story. It'll close with the story of the dingo. This is a beloved Australian animal. Um, we recently published a paper where we've taken into account as a review all the genetic information, the anatomical information, the historical information, very much like those raccoons, trying to understand what is the dingo. There were many people, um, mostly in, in the world of ecology, that are really enamored with the dingo, and I understand why that is. Um, but they would have as one piece of that kind of appreciation of the dingo, holding it up as a species they call Canis dingo. What we've, what we've shown is that the dingo, uh, for all its uniqueness, is just a, a, a branch along the uh, family tree of the domestic dog. This is something that makes sense. It's only been here for a few thousand years, just like those raccoons there for a few hundred years. You just extend that timeline out a little further. Um, it's just a, a, an example of debate that will continue to rage, but uh, it's the last kind of closing example I'm gonna give of this interface between systematics and biodiversity, our efforts to explore and document and understand and organize nature, and how, in very real ways, with a pipistro, uh, with a fungus, with um, these raccoons, with an animal like the dingo, all that can all come home to roost together with decisions about conservation, decisions about management, and, uh, and uh, something that all of us need to work together and take into account. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Chris. So we're just tracking on time, so I might hold questions to the end if that's okay. Sure, so sure. thank you, that was fantastic. Thanks, Chris.
Thank you. So our next keynote speaker um, is Professor Leslie Hughes. So Leslie is Professor of Biological Sciences and Pro Vice Chancellor of Research Integrity and Development at Macquarie University. Um, Leslie's research focuses on the impacts of climate change on species and ecosystems and for conservation policy. So if we could make Leslie feel welcome. Um, well, good morning, everybody, and thank you very much to the organizer. Can you hear me? Yeah? No. Okay. Ah. Can you hear me now? Yes. Um, good morning, everybody, and thank you very much for having me. Uh, thank you to Corey and the organizers for asking me to come and speak with you today. Um, well, that was a really hard act to follow, Chris. Remind me always to ask never to be put on the program after you because I don't have quite as many fluffy cuddlies to show the audience. But I do want to talk about um, a really important topic. It impinges on that theme of extinction that Chris spoke about. And it's about what we face in the future and how we as conservationists and land managers and natural resource people um, are approaching uh, the challenges now and into the future. I want to take you firstly back. I'm not going to be very climatey in this um, talk because I think Carl uh, will probably do a bit more of that after me. But let me take you briefly back to ancient Egypt about 7,000 years ago when uh, formal agriculture really got going. And then fast forward to the 70s, and I know there are people in the audience that probably had clothes like this. Apart from the obvious point that men's fashion and hairstyles have regressed over that period, um, the important thing climatically is that it was a very stable time. If we then take the little bit of time between the 70s and a couple of years ago and compare the rate of climatic change in the 7,000 years versus since the 70s, what we see is that the Earth has been changing in its climate 170 times faster since the 70s than in that previous stable 7,000 year period. So this is the sort of thing that our biodiversity is now having to cope with. Just yesterday, I couldn't resist putting this in, um, just yesterday, the hottest April day on record, both in Sydney, where I flew out of, and Adelaide, where I arrived. We can think about the future in a new way now in terms of what's called the carbon budget, which is basically the amount of carbon we can afford to put into the atmosphere for a certain climatic and temperature result. And the best estimates we have of the carbon budget um, were made in 2015. And what they show is this. To keep to the two degree target embodied in the Paris Climate Agreement, we only have about 20 years of total emissions left because we've already spent more than 70% of that budget. To keep to the 1.5 degree target, which is also embodied in the Paris Climate Agreement, in 2015, we had three years left. You can do the maths on that. It is almost impossible, probably impossible, um, to only get to 1.5 degrees. Um, we'll be very lucky to just be two degrees warmer. And in fact, the most recent United Nations report called the Emissions Gap Report indicates that those pledges at Paris, very well-meaning, many of them, at the moment are only one-third enough to meet that target. And what's more, after a three-year flatlining of emissions, 2014 to 2016, where we were all rather hopeful that at last we had peaked and had turned the corner, last year at global emissions went up 2%. So that's just the context in which we need to operate. And the message, my message so far, is we need to plan for at least two degrees and possibly more than that. 
We know from collations of um, thousands of papers now, including this one published in Science in 2016, that with only about one degree of warming, 80, more than 80% of biological processes thus far studied indicate some sort of change in response to the changing climate. And just briefly, I want to just give you just a little taste of what four degree world might look like. And this comes from some CSIRO modelling a few years ago where they asked the question, okay, what would the World Heritage Wet Tropics of Cairns look like at four degrees with ongoing um, declining rainfall? Well, the answer that they got was that it would look like Jabiru. Now, you do not need to be an expert like the people in this room to understand that while Jabiru has some perfectly nice biodiversity, it is not the storehouse of biodiversity that the Cairns wet tropic is. That's what a four degree world in terms of landscape transformation could look like. We already know that species are adapting. Many species are changing their life cycles. Many species are shifting in their distribution and that is leading to flow on impacts in many communities and many landscapes. And I, won't, I don't have time to go into any of the detail of that. Um, we just know that there's lots and lots of change already happening. Um, and the really big question for all of us, of course, is how fast can species cope? How fast can they adapt in relation to the speed at which the climate is changing? And I don't have time to go into that for every species either. Suffice to say that the sorts of major changes that are being recorded in the literature tend to be for species like this. That is, species that can either fly or swim. They are moving and some of them are moving very rapidly and on a, and a very long way. But of course the majority of species on the planet probably cannot fly or swim. Plants, for example, small invertebrates that are flightless, most mammals, um, most reptiles, amphibians. Uh, the, this whole section of biodiversity is very unlikely to be able to keep up with the pace of climate change simply by going somewhere else. And we've also seen um, extreme events such as heat waves in the, in the last few years have devastating impacts on some populations. This is just a couple of examples. That map in the middle, by the way, is Australia's hottest day, the 8th of January in 2013. I'm really glad I wasn't in South Australia on that particular day when the Bureau had to come up with a new purple colour to denote the extreme of temperature. But on days like that, we see things like that um, endangered um, Carnaby's cockatoo there basically drop dead out of the trees. Uh, Grey-headed flying foxes, hundreds of thousands of individuals have died in heat waves over the last few years. And this photograph was taken last year on the Great Barrier Reef at Heron Island, a very popular snorkelling spot where we had two years in a row of absolutely catastrophic bleaching where over 90% of individual reefs on the Great Barrier Reef were affected in some way. And we now know from surveys done by Terry Hughes, no relation to me, um, that about 50% of the coral that did bleach during those events has now died. Um, and final paper then, uh, one published just last year, um, a really amazing collation estimating that about 47% of terrestrial non-flying threatened mammals, 23% of threatened birds show some sort of negative impact at some part of their range already, remember with only one degree of warming. And we have had many um, predictions now of extinction rates in the future. They're very, very woolly and very, very speculative estimates. And I can say that, I've been involved in some of them. They are very woolly and speculative, but the numbers are very large and they represent um, thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of species. With the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment estimating that whereas the, f the current extinction rate um, is uh, many times that shown in the fossil record, the future extinction rate could be orders of magnitude greater than that. 
So the bottom line is species need our help and the theme of my talk is really how well are we doing at providing that help? Well, we've been very busy. This is a graph from Web of Science of the number of papers published over the last, since the 80s that have climate change somewhere in their title. The total number, um, getting up towards 300,000 papers now, um, if I'd updated this for 2017. That red line shows the number of papers that include species in the title. Uh, the little grey line is where uh, those papers are about impacts on species and the uh, bottom yellow line is the number of papers. Um, it's tens of thousands of papers that have talked about adaptation and species and climate change. So we've done lots and lots and lots of research. But the key question is how much of that knowledge generated by all that research has actually been translated into action? Well, we can think of adaptation action in the climate change space, I think, sort of fairly usefully along a continuum of the sort of passive end, cheap, non-controversial, all the way up to the much more active interventionist end, often expensive, often controversial. So let me just array a few of the sort of familiar adaptation actions along that continuum. We can do what we should be doing anyway, reduce other stresses to build resilience in populations. It's not, of course, enough by itself. This map shows the Great Barrier Reef in terms of the hot spot of bleaching, which was in the northern areas, which is where the other stresses are almost non-existent. It was formerly very pristine. This example simply shows that only reducing other stresses is no guarantee to protect things from the negative impacts of climate change. We can protect our landscape, restore it, reconnect it. All of those things are good things. Turning back the clock on the death by a thousand cuts of our native vegetation. We can build um, new connectivity between landscapes, uh, restore vegetation when we can. Um, but we also know, indicated by my slides before, that many species, even if provided the corridor and the habitat, actually can't keep up simply with the rate of climate change, even when the habitat is there. We can find what we call climate refugia, places in the landscape um, that may be best able to provide refuge to species in the future and protect those places, all good ideas. And at a small scale, we can do some adaptation actions that perhaps protect um, a few things. Um, most of this has been talked about in relation to coral reefs, things like shading, pumping up cold water, et cetera, et cetera. It might work on a very local scale, but it is expensive um, and it's local. So we can put those sort of actions on this continuum. Let me talk about a few more actions. We can think about creating new habitat. All of these pictures really um, show you some examples of creating habitat. That pile of rather unattractive vessel blocks is the substrate building um, a new coral reef. We can create artificial wetlands. We can make seawalls more accessible for species. We can green our cities. Um, it really operates on the sort of, with apologies to Kevin Costner, um, build it and they will come. We also have to think about controlling, some, in some cases, those species that are doing very well out of climate change, even though they're native. Here's just two examples, the long-spined sea urchin in Tasmania. It's moved down the coast where it was native to New South Wales, arrived in Tasmania more than a decade ago. It's eating out the kelp forest. Uh, it's doing very well, it loves Tasmania, um, but it's destroying the habitat for more than 150 other species. It's native, what do we do about it? The other example there is lianas. Lianas are doing very well also in their native rainforests. They're um, taking up CO2 with a vengeance, they're getting bigger and bolder, um, and they're causing more tree mortality. To quote one of my CSIRO colleagues, do we shoot them or give them medals? It's a serious management question. And the final intervention I want to talk about a bit more is moving species somewhere else. 
controversial, expensive, um, and at that active engineering end of that continuum. So the question is, how many of these adaptation actions that we've all been talking about and trying to do for the last 30 plus years have actually been implemented with outcomes in, in the space of climate change? I want to talk about just one example because it's an example in my view of complete and utter failure. And that is the translocation question. In the literature, translocation, or now known as assisted colonisation outside a historic range, has been talked about as a climate change adaptation action for more than 30 years. Um, there are hundreds of published papers. There are 25 published, at least, decision frameworks aimed at policymakers to help them make the decisions about what to move, when to move it, and how to move it. So the real question is, how many times has it actually been done? Of course, we've done lots of translocation for conservation means, you know, to offshore islands, that sort of thing. But how many times has it actually been done for a climate change purpose? Now, I'd like you all to think of a number between zero and a thousand, just roughly. As a hint, probably closer to the zero than the thousand. Have you all got a number in mind? Did anybody say two to themselves? If you said two, you're right. And you get the lucky door prize. In my view, the measure of impact of this sort of adaptation action is how many species we've actually moved successfully to protect them from climate change. Well, here's the two. The first one was done 22 years ago. Um, America's most endangered gymnosperm, Terea taxifolia. It was moved several hundred kilometres south to cooler climates, um, oh, sorry, north to cooler climates, um, by a community group called the Terea Guardians. They didn't actually use any of those frameworks that we've all published. They just got out and did it. And the second one, was two years ago, the western swamp tortoise in Western Australia, Australia's most endangered uh, tortoise, was moved as a trial to several swamps um, that were not drying out to take it out of the swamps um, that were drying out. As far as I know, that is it. 30 years of talking about it, hundreds of papers, 25 frameworks, two species moved. Here's a species that we should have moved, and it comes back to some of the themes of Chris's talk. This is the Bramble Key, at least it was, the Bramble Key Malomies, a native rodent. That little island there, Bramble Key, was its only known habitat. You don't actually have to be a sea level expert, I think, to understand that that was a pretty risky place to live. Um, back in the late 70s, there were several hundred of these um, on the island, 90 in 1998, about 10 in 2002, 2004. The last sighting by a fisherman was in 2009, and last year it was declared presumed extinct. I'm hoping Chris in Papua New Guinea might find a few more if he really looks for them, but as far as we know, that's it for Australia. We did have a name for this one, unlike some of Chris's species. We did have a recovery plan. It was listed as endangered back in the early uh, 2000s. Um, and climate change was addressed as an issue in that recovery plan. The red is my own, um, is my own colouring. It said that the consequences, there might be consequences of climate change, but they're unlikely to have had any major impact on the survival of the Bramble Key Malomies during the life of this plan. Well, the plan was published in 2008, and it probably went extinct about a year or two later. And going back now and looking at the island, it's very clear that most of the island has been inundated due to tropical storms um, during that period because sea level is rising in the Torres Strait at around about twice the global average. When you take another look at this recovery plan um, and do a word search on things like captive breeding, translocation, assisted colonisation, even climate adaptation, those words and phrases don't actually exist there. The species was basically monitored to extinction. 
In fact, this, the, the demise of the Malomis actually prompted a student and I to have a look at a hundred other recovery plans for how well they were doing in terms of looking at the climate change question. And we, we selected a hundred recovery plans at random, 50 for plants and 50 for animals. Um, about 57% of them mentioned climate change. Only 22% had actions specifically tying um, them to climate change. And only 9% of them recommended any form of interventionist action. So we've really got a situation of cognitive dissonance. That is, we can keep a couple of completely contradictory thoughts in our head at the same time. Um, here's one example, and I'll finish off with these two examples. A survey of 160 experts, just like the, uh, uh, um, the, the audience here, experts on conservation, land management, came to the conclusion that there was near universal agreement that climate change was an issue and we needed to manage in the face of it. But when these same people were offered a choice of actual action between a traditional action like making a national park or a more interventionist action like translocation, they overwhelmingly chose the traditional action. Another example from some of our own work in my lab um, looked at how um, land restorationers looked at planting local versus non-local provenance for long-term sustainability of restoration projects. 80% of them said, yep, climate change was an issue. 67% they would consider using non-local provenance. But in fact, only 45% were seriously considering using it and less than one third were actually thinking at all long-term about future restoration. So my take home messages from this. We don't have a lot of time. We have relatively few species, I believe, that will cope long term. We have a lot of knowledge. We've done a lot of research. There is widespread recognition of the risks, but policy and practice lag an awful long way behind this knowledge. And my call, my clarion call, I guess, from this talk is that far bolder action is needed. And I want to skip through, because I'm a bit running out of time, I'm going to skip through to my last slide, which is this one. It's my favourite poster from the climate marches of 2015 that occurred just before the Paris Climate Summit. We are the ones we've been waiting for. Um, I think that's all of us. Thank you very much. That was fantastic, and I think we've got the less talk, more action. <laughs> so we've got time for one quick question, if someone's got one. Yes, um, are you, just to clarify, so part of that proposition is to use non-native vegetation in green vegetation projects? Um, no, the, the, the question that we were asking them was not um, non-native non vegetation, it was using non-local provenance. So even the same species, but with seeds collected from more than, say, 20 kilometres away from, say, a drier or hotter location. There's still enormous resistance, even to that, of using the same species, but with seed collected from somewhere else. Yeah. And just and one more, yeah. And it's, it's actually follows from that. Yeah. Thank you. My question relates to that and it actually follows from that. In my question is, as someone who is part of the revegetation area, what provenance do we use? We've had this discussion over and over and over, but we have no idea how far to go. Yep. Okay. So, um, I, a couple of the slides that I skipped over have, have a link and, and maybe talk to me at morning tea. Um, that same student that worked with me on that has developed um, a revegetation guide for climate change. Um, which is uh, hosted by the Australian Plant Conservation Network on their website. Um, and it actually goes through a step-by-step -step process using things like the Climate Analogue Tool developed by CSIRO and the Atlas of Living Australia to indeed do that, to find the provenances that um, you could use in thinking about longer-term sustainability. But I'm um, happy to um, give you that link. Yeah. All right. Th thanks, Leslie. Thank, Thank you. you. It's fantastic.
All right, so our final keynote speaker this morning is Dr. Carl Berganza. Carl is the Head of Climate Monitoring at the Bureau of Meteor Meteorology. Um, through his work at the BOM, Carl has a key role in briefing government agencies on climate change. So thanks, Carl. Morning, everyone. So I'm going to talk a little bit about risk um, when it comes to climate change. So we're all in the business of managing climate risk. Humans have always been in the business of managing climate risk. Um, the first climate model is a calendar, basically, that allows you to plot the changing seasons, plan your crops or plan your um, foraging. Uh, it, it's basically a model for solar-driven variability in the climate system. It's not a new science. It's a very old science. Um, but these days, we're managing more than that. So um, the change in the atmospheric composition has is, is, um, introduced a new element to climate risk. Um, and that's a large theme of this conference, obviously, going forward. So climate change is happening now. Um, I've just drawn this little table here um, of things that are happening at the moment and things that are emerging. So um, for Australia, obviously, increased frequency of large scale heat waves and record high temperatures, uh, something that is impacting on the continent now. It's impacting on urban populations. It's impacting on rural populations. It's impacting on ecosystems across the continent. Um, we've got a longer fire season, so there's more extreme fire days during that season. It pushes further into spring and autumn, and the most severe fire weather danger days are getting uh, more severe during that period. Um, we've also got prolonged high ocean temperatures, so Leslie talked about um, the back-to-back -back bleaching on the Great Barrier Reef, and I'll come back to that example later in the talk. Um, emerging is also more time spent in drought uh, globally, um, as well as in Australia. Um, a great proportion of rainfall coming from heavy rainfall events. So as the planet warms up, um, the atmosphere can hold more water. Um, the oceans pump more water into that atmosphere, so your rainfall rates go up quite dramatically. Um, and the big one that is going to impact on not just Australia but our region, um, every mega delta from Korea through to Pakistan, um, is the increased frequency of coastal storm surge inundation with sea level rise. So the challenges are significant. <laughs> Um, this is what uh, climate change looks like when matched to population pressure, when matched to inappropriate governance, potentially. So um, the picture at the top there is the Watercliff Dam, which is to the west of Cape Town. Um, it's looking very dry, as you can see right now. Um, it is part of the Western Cape water supply system, which is a very um, um, extensive engineering works to supply um, water to Cape Town. Um, what you can see in the bottom there is people queuing up. So um, for people that don't know, Cape Town was approaching day zero, which is the day that they ran out of water in that uh, Western Cape water supply system. They've pushed that back um, largely by going to quite severe water restrictions. So I think something between 20, 15 or 25 litres of water a day. Uh, so obviously that's something that most managers, asset managers, governments don't want to see, uh, people in Australia don't want to see. And that's the challenge that we, we have. So looking at that graph there, that is the water in, in, available in the dam. And you can see it's been going down steadily since 2013. Um, looking at the rainfall data, so I've got a few graphs there. Um, it's hard to see a trend. That's because rainfall is quite difficult to see a trend. But you can see um, prior to the 1980s, you've got some quite high uh, rainfall years tailing off in the last two decades. Um, with some low rainfall years and, and, and a loss of those really wetting, wetting periods. So as well as impacting on the urban supplies, you've now got uh, basically no water for agriculture right around that region. And I don't know if my mouse works or not. Um, the, the, the dams over here, um, Cape Town's here, you've got the ranges in between, but largely agriculture in the, this region stopped. Um, the map there on the right is rainfall trends globally, and you can see these brown patches if you just focus on the southern hemisphere, kind of in a latitude ring around the continent, uh, around the globe, around the hemisphere, um, the western facing capes or western facing coasts of Chile, um, Australia, and uh, southern Africa all have this rainfall decline. Um, as the tropics are expanding, we're pushing the frontal systems that brought rainfall to these parts of the world further south. So it's still raining, it's raining over the southern ocean, um, not over those land areas. So that's something we're dealing with. Um, right around the hemisphere. 
Um, here's a picture from Lake Hume in 2007 during the Millennium Drought. So dry dams aren't something that are foreign to Australians, obviously. Um, but it is actually, if I've got one positive message today, um, we do quite a good job of um, managing our water resources in Australia. So if you can remember that graph from um, the Western Cape, uh, the top graph there is from Southwest WA. So there's less rainfall in Southwest WA on an annual basis and the rainfall decline is actually more severe than it is um, in, in South Africa. Again, you can see prior to 1970s, those high rainfall years. So this was about the most reliable wintertime rainfall in the country. Um, it has an ecological niche similar to um, the eucalyptus regnans, the mountain ash in the southeast. It's got the Cary and Mary forest, um, obviously wet for millennia. Um, the Calitris, so the um, tree ring species show that drought periods are probably no more than about 20 years. So um, it's been about 40 years now with this rainfall decline. That decline in rainfall, about 25%, matches through to about a 60% drop in stream flow as the, as the soils and the vegetation get dry. So that's what's happened in South Africa. It's what's happened here as well. Um, what I've got there is 1997, we started the IOC Research Partnership. So the Indian Ocean Climate Initiative, uh, the WA government, CSIRO, BOM and others. Um, and that is um, evidence of what happens when you target research in the right place and start it at the right time. So um, it's, re it's resulted in a number of policy outcomes in the southwest, um, desalination plants. There's two that are built. There's probably another one that will be built, maybe another two um, before we're done. Um, sewage reclamation, recharging the groundwater, for example. We've had a similar rainfall decline in the southeast, but it's been more recent. Um, we're a bit further south. We get rainfall from other directions. Um, but again, it's really the loss of those cold fronts and cutoff lows. Um, the Siaki Partnership, which is something, something that's a bit more familiar to those in the southern Murray-Darling Basin. Um, quite a lot of state governments and water authorities and BOM and CSIRO were involved in that. And again, the outcome there was to understand what was driving those rainfall declines. IOC was named that because we didn't know what was causing that rainfall decline. We thought it could be something off the Indian Ocean, but it turns out that it is greenhouse gases. Um, it's a long-term decline. And again, we have some sort of a roadmap for the southeast in terms of what we do to decouple our water security from the climate system itself. So just to underscore the challenge that we've still got in front of us and that we're not actually meeting, um, nothing really demonstrates that better than future sea level. So the lead times you need to plan research, to design outcomes and to implement policy are quite long. Um, sea level, so coastal ecosystems are squeezed from both ends, so we're having rising seas, increasing storm surge inundation, and increasing urbanisation from the other side. And eventually that rising sea will actually impact on those assets at, at, at the coastal level, and that's right around Australia and regionally, obviously. Um, that's an inundation map for Adelaide at 2100 under a high emission scenario. It's one of the less dramatic places in the country. Um, I could have shown Cairns where the whole city is underwater for a um, storm surge uh, later this century, for example. So the salient things from that is that it takes a long time to plan and build sea level defences. Um, if you look at the Thames Barrage, um, it's probably a three decade build from designing it um, through to completion. So really, if we are going to protect the harbours and bays of our cities now, um, if we're going to barrage, say, Port Phillip Heads or Sydney Harbour, um, those engineering works and scoping works should have started already, um, and they haven't. So that's a long lead time, um, but we are capable of doing those sorts of things. So. Um, for example, submarines take a long time to build. They'll be ready by 2050. So we do look to that kind of a horizon um, for when we undertake these kinds of works. So compound extreme events are the things that are going to get us. And my talk today is a little bit about what that means for understanding risk. So not so long ago, we were just talking about a median, so a mid-level emission scenario, the, the, the mid of the pack, not the high end. Um, models that are producing um, quite a lot of climate sensitivity, not the low end ones. We'd go with one variable, maybe rainfall or temperature, and we'd try and determine risk off those. Um, in a very short space of time, over five years, as the finance system and other places have understood that they're exposed to this climate risk, they've asked the science to actually give them the worst case scenario so that they can stress test um, whatever it is. It's an operational system, might be a bit of critical infrastructure, it might be a natural asset. Um, that rapid shift um, has the science not quite ready to actually pr pr produce that, and I'll demonstrate that um, in the next few slides. But it's the compound extremes, it's those ones where you get um, different extremes of different duration and different 
variables all interacting with each other. So it's a long-term rainfall decline coupled with a few years of high temperatures, coupled with an intense heat wave, coupled with a short, really um, intense drought, for example. We don't normally go looking for those sorts of things in climate models. Um, we need to know the vulnerability first if we're going to crank up a supercomputer and actually get really high resolution impacts out of the models to actually do that. And a lot of that mapping hasn't actually been done. So I've got an example here from Tasmania across 2015 and 2016. It's a little vignette of climate change through the eyes of a compound extreme event. So what's going on in the background? Um, we know that spring is getting warmer across the country. So the orange on the map there on the right is highest on record temperatures. Across 2012 to 2015, the three hottest springs on record occurred in Australia, um, all um, adjacent to each other. So there's a warming trend. Um, there's also an increase in fire danger. So the bottom map there is the forest fire danger index. Um, it's a measure of how quickly a fire spreads, so weather conducive to fire. Um, we know that that's happening in the background as well. And it's not just the scientists that know that, it's also um, uh, natural resource managers, uh, fire managers, emergency services, uh, water managers. Everyone's aware of these trends. Um, Southern Australia's been drier, as I've already talked about. So um, the rainfall maps there show it's been mostly in the cool season where we've lost rainfall, but for Tasmania, it's actually been in both seasons. Um, that's because they're impacted by those frontal systems, not just in the winter, but in summer as well. So they've lost their rainfall year round. Um, you can see the past 20 years lowest on record for the western half of the state there. And looking over the 2015-16 period, we were on trend. So you don't need to be on trend. Um, if you look at the bottom graph there, looking at rainfall, there are some years where the rainfall will still be high. It's just that we've got a background trend of reducing rainfall. And over this period, uh, two-year period, uh, we were basically consistent with those trends. That map looks pretty much like the trend map just for that two-year period. So what happens when this trend meets weather? So um, leading into, so, so as this um, um, situation developed and El Nino developed in the Pacific across 2015, that normally brings drier and, and hotter temperatures to Eastern Australia, sometimes to Tasmania. Um, when you combine it with the trend, it's not just hotter and drier, it's, it's sometimes at the extreme end. So um, for October 2015, combined with an El Nino, combined with that background trend, we had the hottest October on record, the driest October on record, and the most severe fire weather on, on record for that, for that period, all intersecting with each other. It's generally during these periods that unusual things happen, such as fire in old growth wet forest that hasn't occurred maybe ever um, over the life of that forest on the scale that we've seen it. Um, there's human decisions going on. So we went into this period with low hydro storages across Hydro Taz. Um, over this summer, the interconnector connecting electricity from Tasmania to Victoria failed. So um, we were importing uh, diesel generators over from the mainland to back up the electricity supply during this event. So that's a compound event. Um, what happened next is we went to flood. So uh, not just any flood, um, probably the worst flood or almost certainly the worst flood that Northern Tasmania has seen, um, certainly over the, over the record keeping period. That switch from drought to flood um, is definitely something that the models have long said would happen, particularly in the Pacific. So when we're talking about those Pacific islands, that disruption to their rainfall pattern and the sequencing of extreme events um, is something that's really gonna impact um, in terms of, and if you're t talking risk and stress testing, what's gonna break a system, it's that sequence and it's whether we we're actually properly characterizing that risk right now. Um, to, to understand that. So again, looking at this rainfall, what was going on in the background? Um, in May 2016, so just before, the, so, so the month just before the week of that rainfall, um, the orange there is highest on record sea surface temperatures. And as I said at the start, warm seas provides um, moisture into the atmosphere and increased rainfall rates. So how warm was it in the Tasman Sea? Um, you can see over the right here, it wasn't just a little bit above the previous record, it was about double. Now, if you look in a climate model, you have to do quite a lot of individual climate model simulations to actually come up with something that looks that dramatic. It's not something that pops out straight away. So that's really salient again, is if we're properly um, characterising our risk space, if we're going to the models to determine it rather than to the vulnerability, you're probably going to underdo it. So keeping your eye on that warm water, um, we had an east coast low sit um, just above 
above that region. That means that the winds are channeling in this northeast direction, picking up all that moisture and dumping it onto the New South Wales and Tasmanian coast. So subtropical moisture um, along New South Wales isn't necessarily unusual, um, even at that time of year. It was a compound event, so it was also a high sea level event as it was pushing um, that um, um, water up along the coast. So that was that famous picture from Colroy Beach where someone's um, pool fell into the foreshore there. Um, but for northern Tasmania, it's really unusual. So when we looked above Hobart Airport during this event, the amount of water in the atmosphere was about 40% above the previous daily record. So again, that massive jump isn't necessarily something you're gleaning from the climate model space at all. And um, we had five rivers in flood, um, picking up freshwater crays and depositing them over paddocks, essentially right, right across northern Tasmania. Um, that's Cataract Gorge. I don't know if people are familiar with what that looks like normally. It doesn't look like that. That looks like... Um, an Alaskan glacier melt or something else. But yeah, it's, it's um, quite an extreme outcome. So what can we do to construct these events? Well, as I said, you're not necessarily led there by the models, but you are led there by your vulnerability. So I'm just going to show an example from the Great Barrier Reef where we possibly don't even need to go to a climate model at all um, if we properly understand the vulnerability that we're dealing with. And when it comes to the reef, the reef ecologists have done a fantastic job of understanding that. So they can hand the climate scientists a really neat set of vulnerabilities, um, such as thermal stress, crown-of-thorn starfish, which is increased by sedimentation, um, tropical cyclones. So we have this whole gamut that we can put together in a cumulative sense. And it actually just takes someone expert in weather to put that together in a plausible way um, that potentially antagonises the vulnerabilities that we're talking about. So sea surface temperatures during that back-to-back -back bleaching period, 2015-16, it wasn't just the Tasman, it was the whole north of Australia that was warmest on record. Again, you can see it wasn't just a little bit above, it was quite a jump um, previously. These are degree heating days, so it's accumulation of positive heat um, anomalies over the reef. And you can see what happened in the three years. Um, the bleaching occurred in 2015, 2016, 2017, 2018. Again, if you went to a climate model, you wouldn't find back-to-back -back bleaching on the reef. In fact, you wouldn't even resolve this. Um, it doesn't resolve weather at that scale. You would need to run um, a nested weather model inside um, the climate model, both in the ocean and the atmosphere. Again, that's a supercomputing task. You wouldn't just do that randomly. You need to understand your vulnerability before you undertake an exercise like that. But that's what we're dealing with. So having actually experienced that and sp experiencing um, what it actually did to the reef, um, we can ask ourselves a series of questions. So this is the last graph I'm showing, but what it is is temperatures over the Coral Sea from December through to April. And you can see it rises over summer. In those years where we have an El Nino, where we have a lack of cloud cover over um, the late February, March period, the temperature peaks then, and that's typically when you get your bleaching events. Um, looking at those back-to-back -back bleaching years, they are well above the pack. So this is the 1900 to 1930 average for the temperature curve. Um, this is your average El Nino event in dotted lines there, and the dashed line there is your average from 1900 to 2016. So we're way above the pack there, and the question would be, um, well, that was what happened in 2015, 2016. What's the likelihood that we get three years in a row? It turns out that that's quite plausible if you consider an El Nino, La Nina cycle. Um, you could get three years of those bleaching events in a row, and it could happen in the next 10 years, really. And what happens if we get those events followed by a tropical cyclone that makes its way all the way down the reef? Um, that's a real tropical cyclone. That's tropical cyclone Hamish in 2009. Um, and following an event like that, um, the mechanical damage on the reef and then probably flooding and sediment flush into, into, the, into the reef um, compounds that event again. And we can actually construct an event like that just based on the vulnerability and the knowledge of our weather. So that's kind of where we're probably going to go now. Um, we see overseas, they're a little bit more mature in this area than us. They are stress testing a range of natural and built systems um, for these compound extreme events, but we are just starting that in Australia. Um, so I'll be around for the, for the rest of the um, day if someone wants to ping me on, on what, we, what we can do in this space as Bureau and CSIRO um, um, science providers. Um, it is an interesting area. Thank you. So, have we got questions? Anyone? Everyone's shy. Everyone's overwhelmed. <laughs> um, 
Thanks, Dr. Buganza. For me, one of the elephants in the room, um, and a further inconvenient truth is the issue of uh, weather modification, weather manipulation, climate engineering, geoengineering. We know that trillions of dollars of uh, funds around the world are being diverted into um, research programs. There are thousands of patents dealing with these issues. Um, and they might start with things that are relatively benign, seemingly, such as uh, cloud seeding and so on. Um, then we can go on to technologies that are being proposed and put forward, such as solar radiation management, which uh, would see the wide-scale dispersion of aerosols and particulates into the upper atmosphere and so on by aircraft. Um, apart from the fact that uh, you know there's obvious concern about uh, heavy metal fallout from that, the fact that it wouldn't deal with heating oceans, I mean the acidification of oceans, um, the, the world needs sunlight, it fuels photosynthesis, our bodies um, need to make vitamin D with sunlight, um, 300 genes are turned on, sunlight uh, uh, acts against molds or keeps molds and funguses in, in balance. There are millions of people around the world that believe such uh, uh, sort of um, radiation management or, uh, is already underway. Um, we're seeing in the environmental records massive contamination with uh, heavy metals like uh, aluminium, barium and strontium. Um, so I'm not sure how that's all explained. Then there are anomalies like blue snow f falling and, and snow forming in conditions when the... Sorry? There is a question, and that's really um, to understand why this sort of discussion isn't coming into the public sphere when it might. Um, it uh, certainly is apparent, and I could go on, and I obviously shouldn't, but um, uh, yeah, it's something that needs to come into the public discourse, it needs to be discussed, governance models need to be discussed, and uh, it, it's the kind of thing that really should be opened up for public discussion and uh, look at. Just wondering what your comments are on that. Um, there's a lot said there. Uh, I guess, look, when it comes to um, what we do to ameliorate future climate change, we did, so the IPCC ran a uh, um, projection scenario called RCP 2.6, and that was a scenario where we stabilise emissions by mid-century and then actually remove carbon from the atmosphere um, by some method that we don't quite know how to do yet. So um, if we were talking about geoengineering for climate change, I think most scientists would say that a method of removing carbon from the atmosphere is probably the safest one to embark on. All of the others have a range of risks with them and it would be difficult to see how we would unilaterally embark on geoengineering of that scale without an international agreement. And if you did, it would be it would be quite a big deal, I, I imagine. So, um, but these things are being discussed um, within the scientific circles. Yeah. So, Carl, just so one of the things that I think you were saying was, if we understand the vulnerabilities of the systems, it's easier for cli the climate modellers to, to help understand what might happen. So, for an audience like this, what are the sorts of things we should? Yeah. Do? So, so mapping those vulnerabilities is something that, um, in our work, we're finding isn't really done to a great extent. So. Um, if you think about the economic system, your um, vulnerability to changes in um, currency rates and you know, steel prices and everything else, the, the knock-on effect of that to distributed industries is actually quite well understood. Um, when it comes to climate change, that's really poorly appreciated, largely because we aren't all climate scientists and we've spent a long time trying to communicate that the problem was a reality rather than getting into the nitty gritty of understanding what our vulnerabilities yeah. were and what they're going to mean. So we're going to have to compress that now into about a decade yeah. of doing this work. Yeah, and that nicely ties in with what Leslie was saying around, we, we've done a lot of talking, but we haven't actually managed to convert it to something that needs to happen. And, you know, and that's in the adaptation space as well. So um, yeah. it's also the mitigation space that needs to yeah. relate to that. And I guess that brings us back to Chris. What, Chris, what you were talking about in the beginning was we haven't even discovered everything yet, so we're not even sure what things are. So, um, and I think I had a, and we had a question for you, Chris, which I've somehow magically got on my phone. I'm not going to ask how that happened, but Corey's got something going on with the hashtag. Um, so someone was really curious to know um, the fungus that, that affected the bats um, in America, um, how did that actually get there and what's the chance that it might come to um, Australia? Okay, yeah, a word about that. White nose syndrome fungus. Um, that we don't really know. It's really hard to uh, 
piece together what happened, but the best going bet is that uh, we know when it happened uh, within about a year and, and where it happened in caves in places like New York and Pennsylvania in the northeastern United States. It probably came from, from a caver uh, who had, who had uh, not kind of cleansed materials between caving in Europe and caving in the northeastern U.S. That's really, that's really the only way out of the various kind of hypotheses to explain it. Yeah. Uh, and that's, that's just, again, a, we think about biosecurity and quarantine and how important yeah. these things are. But again, nobody knew that that fungus existed. You know, it, uh, if people had been, it, it grows as, white nose, as a white nose covering uh, in European bats, but it's not pathological. It doesn't wipe them out. It may have in the past. You might infer that in the deep past, European bats maybe went through some bottleneck from being affected by it, and there's reasons to think that. But um, uh, we didn't. Study, the point was we didn't start studying this until it had caused all that trouble. Yeah. Yeah. So whether it's a Christmas Island pipistrelle declining and we start studying it, a fungus taking off and causing you know a lot of trouble, and, and we start studying it, part of my point, of course, was it's better to. Uh, to have systematic efforts to document biodiversity before the fires start. Yeah, yeah. No, that's great. Well, thank you. So can we please thank our keynote speakers? <laughs> so thanks, everyone. It's um, morning tea, and we'll see you all back in, in here um, straight after morning tea for the panel session. And I assume that's just three minutes. So I just yeah. You're giving me up some minutes, aren't you? So when I go over time. <coughs> now, is there any chance of putting the slide on halfway through the talk?